We are continuing our extended story on Thumb Winds End of the Road in Michigan podcast, A Fortnight in the Wilderness by Alexis de Tocqueville. In 1831, two 26 year old French aristocrats, Alexis de Tocqueville and Gustave de Beaumont, decided to strike out, in what today's terms, would be the ultimate road trip. Namely, traveling overland from Detroit, to the last settlement in the Northwest Territories, to Saginaw, Michigan. This is the fifth part of our series. When we last left Alex and Gustav, they had traveled from Pontiac to the Flint River to a place known then as the Grand Traverse. Here they obtained the services of two native guides to complete their journey to Saginaw. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's tale from the end of the road. Part 5, July 25, 1831 from the Flint River to Saginaw. On the next day, July 25th, our first care was to inquire for a guide. A wilderness of 40 miles separates Flint River from Saginaw, and the road is a narrow pathway, hardly perceivable. Our host approved of our plan and shortly brought us two Indians whom he assured us that we could perfectly trust. One was a boy of 12 or 14, the other a young man of 18. The frame of the latter, though it had not yet attained the vigor of maturity, gave the idea of agility united with strength. He was of middle height, his figure was tall and slender, his limbs flexible and well-proportioned. Long tresses fell from his bare head. He had also taken care to paint his face with black and red in symmetrical lines, a ring was passed through his nose, and a necklace and earrings completed his attire. His weapons were no less remarkable. At one side hung the celebrated tomahawk, on the other, a long sharp knife, with which the savages scalped their victims. Round his neck hung a cow horn, containing his powder, and in his right hand, he held a rifle. As is the case with most Indians, his eye was wild, and his smile benevolent. At his side, to complete the picture, trotted a dog, with upright ears and long nose, more like a fox than any other animal, with a look so savage as to be in perfect harmony with the countenance of his master. After examining our new companion with attention which he did not seem to notice, we asked him his price for the service that he was about to render to us. The Indian replied in a few words of his native tongue, and the American immediately informed us that what he asked was about equivalent to two dollars. As these poor Indians, charitably added our host, do not understand the value of money, you will give the dollars to me, and I will willingly give him what they represent. I was curious to see what this worthy man considered to be equal to two dollars, and I followed him quietly to the place where the bargain was struck. I saw him give to our guide a pair of moccasins and a pocket handkerchief, that certainly together did not amount to half the sum. The Indian withdrew quite satisfied, and I made no remark, saying to myself, with La Fontaine, ah, I if the lions were painters. However, the Indians are not the only dupes of the American pioneers. Every day we were ourselves, victims, to their extreme cupidity. It is true that they do not steal. They are too intelligent to commit any dangerous breach of the law, but I never saw an innkeeper in a large town overcharged so impudently as these tenants of the wilderness, among whom I fancied I should find primitive honesty and patriarchal simplicity. All was ready, we mounted our horses, and wading across the rivulet, Flint River, which forms the boundary of civilization, we entered the real wilderness. Our two guides ran or rather leapt like a wild cat's over the impediments of the road. When we came to a fallen tree, a stream, or a bog, they pointed to the right path but did not even turn round to see us get out of the difficulty. Accustomed to trust only to himself, the Indian can scarcely understand that others need help. He is willing to serve you in an emergency, but as yet he has not been taught the art of adding value to his services by kindness and solicitude. We might have ventured on some reproofs, but it was impossible to make our companions understand a word. Besides, we felt that we were entirely in their power. Here, in fact, the scale was reversed. Plunged in this impenetrable gloom, reduced to rely on our personal strength, we children of civilization groped blindly on, incapable, not only of threading the labyrinth, but even of finding in it the means of sustenance. In these difficulties lay the triumph of the savage. For him the forest had no secrets, to him, it was a home, he walked through it with head erect, guided by instinct more unerring than the navigator's compass. At the top of the loftiest tree, under the densest foliage, his eye discovered the game, close to which the European would have passed a hundred times in vain. From time to time our Indians halted. 
they place their fingers on their lips, in token of silence, and sign to us to dismount. Guided by them, we reach the spot whence we could see the bird for which we were searching. It was amusing to observe the contemptuous smile with which they led us by the hand like children, and at last, brought us near to the object they themselves had discovered long before. As we proceeded, we gradually lost sight of the traces of man. Soon all proofs even of savage life disappeared, and before us was the scene that we had so long been seeking, a virgin forest. Growing in the middle of the thin brushwood, through which objects are perceived at a considerable distance, was a single clump of full-grown trees, almost all pines or oaks. Confined to so narrow space, and deprived of sunshine, each of these trees had run up rapidly, in search of air and light. As straight as the mast of a ship, the most rapid grower had overtopped every surrounding object, only when it had attained a higher region did it venture to spread out its branches, and clothe itself with leaves. Others followed quickly in this elevated sphere, and the whole group, interlacing their boughs, formed a sort of immense canopy. Underneath this damp, motionless vault, the scene is different. Majesty and order are overhead, near the ground, all is chaos and confusion, aged trunks, incapable of supporting any longer their branches, are shattered in the middle, and present nothing but a sharp jagged point. Others, long loosened by the wind, have been thrown. Unbroken on the ground. Torn up from the earth, their roots form a natural barricade, behind which several men might easily find shelter. Huge trees, sustained by the surrounding branches, hang in midair, and fall into dust, without reaching the ground. There is no district with us so scantily peopled as to make it possible for a forest to be so completely abandoned that the trees, after quietly fulfilling the purpose of their existence, attain old age undisturbed, and at last perish from natural decay. Civilized man strikes them while yet in their prime, and clears the ground of their remains. In the solitude of America, all-powerful nature is the only instrument of ruin, as well as of reproduction. Here, as well as in the forests over which man rules, death strikes continually, but there is none to clear away the remains, they accumulate day by day. They fall, they are heaped one upon another. Time alone does not work fast enough to reduce them to dust, so as to make way for their successors. Side by side lay several generations of the dead. Some, in the last stage of dissolution, have left on the grass a long line of red dust as the only trace of their presence, others, already half consumed by time, still preserve their outward shape. Others, again, fallen only yesterday, stretch their long branches over the traveler's path. When at sea I have often enjoyed one of the calm, serene evenings, when the sails, flapping idly from the mast, leave the crew in ignorance even of the quarter whence the breeze will rise. The perfect repose of nature is as striking in the wilderness as on the ocean. When at noonday the sun's rays penetrate the forest, there is often heard a long sob, a kind of plaintive cry echoing in the distance. It is the last breath of the expiring breeze. Deep silence ensues, and such absolute stillness fills the mind with a kind of superstitious awe. The traveler stops to contemplate the scene. Pressed against one another, their boughs interlaced, the trees seem to form one vast indestructible edifice, under whose arches reign eternal darkness. Around our violence and destruction, shattered trees and torn trunks, the traces of long elemental war. But the struggle is suspended. It seems to have been suddenly arrested by the order of a supernatural being. Half-broken branches seem to hold by some invisible link to the trunk that no longer supports them, trees torn from their roots hang in the air as if they had not had time to reach the ground. The traveler holds his breath to catch the faintest sound of life. No noise, not even a whisper reaches him. You may be lost in a European forest, but some noise belonging to life is audible. You hear a church bell, or a woodman's axe, or the report of a gun, or the barking of a dog, or, at any rate, the indistinct hum of civilized life. Here, not only man is absent, but the voice of no animal is to be heard. The smaller ones have sought the neighborhood of human dwellings, and the larger have fled to a still greater distance, the few that remain hidden in the shade. Thus all is motionless, all is silent beneath the leafy arch. It seems as if the Creator had for a moment withdrawn his countenance, and all nature had become paralyzed. This was not the only time that we noticed the resemblance of the forest to the ocean. In each case the idea of immensity besets you. The succession of similar scenes, their continual monotony overpowers the imagination. 
Perhaps even the sensation of loneliness and desolation which oppressed us in the middle of the Atlantic was felt by us still more strongly and acutely in the wilderness of the New World. At sea, the voyager sees the horizon to which he is steering. He sees the sky. His view is bounded only by the powers of the human eye. But what is there to indicate a path across this leafy ocean? In vain you may climb the lofty trees, others still higher will surround you. In vain you climb a hill, everywhere the forest follows you, the forest which extends before you to the Arctic Pole, and to the Pacific Ocean. You may travel thousands of miles beneath its shade, and, though always advancing, never appear to stir from the same spot. But it is time to return to our journey to Saginaw. We have been riding for five hours in complete ignorance of our whereabouts when our Indians stopped short, and the elder, whose name was Sagan Kuisko, traced a line in the sand. He showed us one end, exclaiming, Nel, Kantiawang, the Indian name for Flint River, and pointing to the other, pronounced the name of Saginaw. Then, marking a point in the middle, he signed to us that we had achieved half the distance, and that we must rest a little. The sun was already high, and we should gladly have accepted his invitation, if we could have seen water within reach, but as none was near we motioned to the Indian that we wished to halt where we could eat and drink. He understood us directly and set off with the same rapidity as before. An hour later he stopped again and showed us a spot where we might find water about thirty paces off in the forest. Without waiting for us to answer, or helping us to unsaddle our horses, he went to it himself, we followed as fast as we could. A little while before the wind had thrown down a large tree in this place, in the hollow that had been filled by the root was a little reservoir of rainwater. This was the fountain to which our guide conducted us, without the thought apparently has occurred to him that we should hesitate to partake of such a sendar bag. Another misfortune I entirely spoiled our provisions, and we were reduced to the small piece of bread, and although we had been able to procure it to this, a cloud of mosquitoes, attracted by the unity of water, which we were forced to fight with one hand while we carried our bread to our mouths with the other, and an idea may be formed of a rustic dinner in a virgin forest. While we were eating, our Indian sat cross-legged on the prostate trunk that I have mentioned. When they saw that we had finished, they made signs that they too were hungry. We showed them our empty bag, they shook their heads without speaking. The Indian has no fixed hours for his meals, he gorges food when he can, and fasts afterward, until he finds where to satisfy his appetite, wolves have similar habits. We soon began to think of starting, but we were dismayed to find that our horses had disappeared. Goaded, no doubt, by hunger, they had strayed from the road in which we had left them, and it was not without trouble that we succeeded in tracing them, we blessed the mosquitoes that had forced us to continue our journey. The path soon became more and more difficult to follow. Every moment our horses had to force their way through thick brushwood or to leap over the large fallen trees that barred our progress. At the end of two hours of an extremely toilsome ride, we at length reached a stream, which though shallow, was deeply embanked. We waded across it, and from the opposite side, we saw a field of maize and two huts that looked like log houses. As we approached we found that we were in a little Indian settlement, and that the log houses were wigwams. The solitude was no less perfect than in the surrounding forest. When we reached the first of these abandoned dwellings, Sagan Kuisko stopped. He examined attentively everything around him, then laying down his rifle and approaching us, he again traced a line in the sand and showed us by the same method as before that we had accomplished only two-thirds of the road, then he rose and pointing to the sun, signed that it was quickly sinking into the west, next he looked at the wigwam and shut his eyes. This language was easy to understand, he wished us to sleep in this place. I own that the proposal astonished as much as it annoyed us. It was long since we had eaten, and we were but moderately inclined to sleep without supper. The somber savage grandeur of seeing that we had been contemplating ever since the morning, our utter loneliness, the wild faces of our guides, and the difficulty of communicating with them, all conspired to take away our confidence. There was a strangeness too in the conduct of the Indians. Our road for the last two hours had been even more untrodden than at the beginning. No one had told us that we should pass through an Indian village, and everyone had assured us that we could go in one day from Flint River to Saginaw. We could not therefore imagine why our guides wanted to keep us all night in the wilderness. We insisted upon going on. The Indian signed that we should be surprised by darkness in the forest. To force our guides to proceed would have been dangerous. 
I am determined to have recourse to their cupidity. But there is no such a philosopher as the Indian. He has few wants and consequently few desires. Civilization has no hold over him. He neither knows nor cares for its advantages. I had, however, remarked that Sagan Puisco had paid particular attention to a little wicker bottle that hung by my side. A bottle that could not be broken. Here was a thing that he had the sense to appreciate. He really admired it. My gun and my bottle were my only European implements that excited his desires. I signed to him that I would give him the bottle if he would take us immediately to Saginaw. He then seemed to undergo a violent struggle. He looked again at the sun, then on the ground. At last, he came to a decision, seized his rifle, exclaimed twice, with his hand on his mouth, oh I oh, and rushed off before us through the bushes. We followed him at a quick pace, and we soon lost sight of the Indian settlement. Our guides continued to run for two hours faster than before. Still, the night was coming on, and the last rays of the sun had disappeared behind the trees when Sagan Kuisko was stopped by violent bleeding at the nose. Accustomed as the young man, as well as his brother, was to bodily exertion, it was evident that fatigue and want of food had exhausted their strength. We began to fear lest our guides should renounce the undertaking, and insist on sleeping under a tree. We, therefore, proposed to mount them in turns on our horses. They accepted our offer without surprise or shame. It was curious to see these half-naked men gravely seated on English saddles, carrying our game bags and guns slung over their shoulders, while we were toiling on before them. At last, night came. The air under the trees became damp and icy cold. In the dark, the forest assumed a new and terrible aspect. Our eyes could distinguish nothing but confused masses without shape or order, strange and disproportioned forms, the sort of fantastic images which haunt the imagination in fever. The echo of our steps had never seemed so loud, nor. The silence of the forest was so awful the only sign of life in this sleeping world was the humming of the mosquito. As we advanced the gloom became still deeper. Now and then a firefly traced a luminous line upon the darkness. Too late we acknowledged the wisdom of the Indian's advice, but it was no longer possible to recede. We, therefore, pushed on as rapidly as our strength and the night permitted. At the end of an hour, we left the woods and entered a vast prairie. Our guides uttered three times a savage cry, that vibrated like the discordant notes of the tam-tam. It was answered in the distance. Five minutes afterward we reached a stream, but it was too dark to see the opposite bank. The Indians halted here. They wrapped their blankets around them, to escape the stings of the mosquitoes, and hiding in the long grass, looked like balls of wool, that one might pass by without remarking, and could not possibly be men. We ourselves dismounted and waited patiently for what was to follow. In a few minutes we heard a faint noise and something approached the bank. It was an Indian canoe, about ten feet long, formed out of a single tree. The man who was curled up at the bottom of this frail bark wore the dress and had the appearance of an Indian. He spoke to our guides, who, by his direction, took the saddles from our horses, and placed them in the canoe. As I was preparing to get into it, the supposed Indian touched me on the shoulder and said, with a Norman accent which made me start, Ah, you come from old France. Stop, don't be in a hurry, people sometimes get drowned here. If my horse had addressed me, I should not, I think, have been more astonished. I looked at the speaker, whose face shone in the moonlight like a copper ball. Who are you, then? I said. You speak French, but you look like an Indian. He replied, that he was a bois brule, which means the son of a Canadian and an Indian woman. I shall often have occasion to mention the singular race of half-castes, which extends over all the frontiers of Canada, and, in fact, over the borders of the United States. At that time, I felt only the pleasure of conversing in my mother tongue. Following the advice of my countrymen, the savage, I seated myself in the bottom of the canoe, and kept as steady as possible, my horse, whose bridle I held, plunged into the water and swam by my side, meanwhile, the Canadian sculled the bark, singing in an undertone to an old French tune some verses, of which I caught only the first couplet, between Paris and Saint-Denis there lived a maid. We reached the opposite bank without any accident, the canoe immediately returned to bring over my companion. All my life I shall remember the second time that it neared the shore. 
The moon, which was full, was just then rising over the prairie behind us, half the disk. Only appeared above the horizon, it looked like a mysterious door, through which we could catch a glimpse of the light of another world. Its rays were reflected in the stream, and touched the place where I stood. Along the line of their pale, tremulous light, the Indian canoe was advancing. We could not see any skulls, or hear the sound of rollicks. The bark glided rapidly and smoothly, long, narrow, and black, resembling an alligator in pursuit of his prey. Crouching at the prow, Sagan Kuisko, with his head between his knees, showed only his shiny tresses. Further back, the Canadian was silently sculling, while behind followed Beaumont's horse. With his powerful chest throwing up the waters of the Saginaw in glittering streams. In the whole scene there was a wild grandeur which made an impression upon us which has never been effaced. When all had landed, we immediately proceeded to a house that had just become visible in the moonlight about a hundred yards from the river, and which the Canadian assured us would afford us shelter. We contrived, indeed, to establish ourselves tolerably, and we should probably have repaired our strength by a sound sleep if we could have got rid of the myriads of mosquitoes that filled the house, but this was impossible. The tormentor that in English is called a mosquito, and in Canadian French, a meringuin, is a little insect much resembling the French cousin, the gnat. It differs only in size. It is generally bigger, and tea trunk is so sharp, and so strong, that only woolen garments can save you from its sting. These insects are the curse of the American wilderness. They render a long stay unendurable. I never felt torment such as those which I suffered from them during the whole of this expedition, and especially at Saginaw. In the day they prevented us from drawing, or writing, or sitting still for an instant, in the night thousands of them buzzing around us, settling on every spot in our bodies that was uncovered. Awakened by the irritation of the bite, we hid our heads under the sheets, their sting went through. Thus persecuted and chased by them we rose and went into the air till extreme fatigue at last procured for us an uneasy and broken sleep. This concludes this week's special edition story. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Thumb Wind's End of the Road podcast. If you like this kind of story, you are invited to join other monthly visitors on our website at thumbwind.com. Please watch for and download next week's continuation of Alexis de Tocqueville's Saginaw Trail story next Sunday evening. Please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and give us a review. From the End of the Road